what we wonder though is when the dolphin swims really fast as if say it got scared um, will that heart rate change will the underwater heart rate change from 30 beats per minute open up the circulation and suddenly be very high while the animal's underwater because of that um, potential change we think that maybe some of the marine mammals are prone to getting the bends. And this was unheard of before. We're concerned that sounds in the oceans, whether it's coming from sonar, whether it's coming from oil exploration, drilling, any of these things could potentially frighten these animals. As a result, cause them to uh, bolt to the water surface, heart rate suddenly increases, and now you've set the animal up for potentially getting the bends. And that's what these experiments are about. Good boy, Prima. Very brave. And we put those electrodes across the heart of the dolphin. So you'll see we put it on the chest and we put it on the side. And in that way, we pick up the electrical signal from the heart. In doing so, we can see how variable Good that man. dive response is. Good, Primo. So far, what we found is the heart rate's a lot more variable when the animal is swimming underwater than we had imagined. We're finding that it can go upwards of 60 beats per minute. It can change for short periods of time, long periods of time. And as a result, maybe that protection from the brain or from the bends uh, is not, not quite as clear as we once thought. Terry Williams and her team suspect that dolphins may also hold clues which could ultimately save or at least prolong many human lives. We've actually looked at the brains of dolphins and whales and sea otters and sea lions and compared their brains to that of coyotes and mountain lions and foxes and, and mice. What we found is that some of the proteins in the brains, neuroglobin, cytoglobins, that are really important for moving and transporting um, oxygen are different in the marine animals than they are for terrestrial mammals. Also hemoglobin, how much blood is actually coursing through the brain tissue seems to be different for the marine animals than terrestrial animals. We think that this may help protect the brains of um, some of the deep divers and fast swimmers from uh, conditions like stroke. We wonder if the same kinds of proteins or even increasing the vasculature for the human brain, whether those kinds of mechanisms might actually help um, humans to protect the brain or just live a little bit longer. Not all the research conducted at Monterey Bay is land-based. With five and a half thousand square miles of ocean to study, many scientists spend their working lives at sea. Monterey Bay is a rest stop for gray whales when they are migrating north with their calves. During this period, killer whales, actually dolphins called orcas, hunt offshore in the deep waters to snatch the calves from their mothers. I've been studying the killer whales here for the last 20 years or so, and they're totally unpredictable in this area, but this is really one of the only places that you can see killer whales hunting gray whales, where they're actually hunting a larger animal than themselves. And, and that happens because, again, the canyon, the gray whales have to cross the deep water, and that puts them in the range of the killer whales, so they have more of an advantage here of catching the gray whales than anywhere else along the coast. So that's pretty unique. Whales, um, you know, are very highly intelligent, and they teach their young. The mother killer whales teach their young, you know, how to hunt, and they have. They seem to have a culture, so they culturally transmit these behaviors to their young. Killer whales work together as a team, and that sometimes they'll take specific roles. Like one killer whale will often get between the mother gray whale and its calf trying to push them apart because the whole time the, the mother gray whale is trying to protect her calf and keep it near her. The other killer whales are around the edge like pulling on the fluke of the gray whale calf. Another one's trying to get on top, kind of ram it from under.
and it takes several hours, but they're usually pretty successful in separating the mother from the calf. So it's these specific killer whales that live off the California coast that you know are really focused in on how to hunt gray whales. Other places, killer whales are focused on other hunting techniques. We've been studying also their uh, contaminant levels, uh, their genetics, seeing how their calves are doing, and you know how their reproductive rate is, and uh, keeping track of all the individuals. We can identify them by their markings on their fins and studying their predation behavior. So just pretty much everything about them when they come in the area. This is Embari, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. Embari is a world leader in exploring the seabed using submersible vehicles, which they design and build themselves. The submersibles are loaded onto ships from the adjoining harbor and then taken out to the deep ocean. There are a number of different types of submersibles. Kano Rajan and his team have developed what they call an AUV, an autonomous or independent underwater vehicle. You drop it over the uh, side of the ship and effectively it goes off and swims on its own. This has no tether. Uh, it's uh, autonomous in the sense that it has an onboard computer and which can think for itself. Um, it has uh, instruments, a whole series of them. And essentially, if you look at it as um, in abstraction as a dog, you know, it's sniffing around, looking for something interesting. Um, and then, uh, you know, it does something that you've asked it to, and then it comes back to you after some time. You pick it up, bring it home, analyze the data, and, you know, you, you, you see what, how your knowledge can be pushed. The instruments on this vehicle can give us an idea of the health of the ocean. Number one. Number two, it can tell us what kind of physical, chemical, biological processes are going on by sniffing around. Today, research scientists are setting out into Monterey Bay with a different kind of submersible. This is called an ROV, or Remotely Operated Vehicle. The ROV has cameras and various arms for collecting samples, but it remains tethered by cable to this mothership from where the scientists on board control all its actions. The team is taking the ROV to the site of a whale carcass on the seabed. Once the ship reaches the location of the whale fall, the ROV is lowered over the side and the scientists can then monitor its progress. Today we have a, a couple goals that we're trying to accomplish. Uh, we're diving on a, a whale fall called Pebbles at 633 meters deep. And during the dive, Shannon will be collecting bones to analyze and to look at bone-eating worms called Osidax. And they will collect these samples, bring them back up to the laboratory. This is the control room. This is where the ROV pilots, the remotely operated vehicle pilots, can run the vehicle from. It's also a control room for the scientists to control the cameras and to actually look at what we're sampling. So right now we're going along the bottom, approaching the whale and Canute, the pilots just found the whale on the sonar. And so we're approaching it, I think we're at about 10 meters away right now. And we're about 20 kilometers off the coast right now. These whale falls provide important nutrients for other marine life. Well, this is great. There's tons of osidax on this bone here. And so you can see them, they're all over. It makes it look kind of fuzzy. And this is actually one of three new species we have on this whale, which is wonderful. These worms are really cool. They have no mouths, no guts, nothing. They completely rely nutritionally on their symbionts. So we're going to collect a few of these bones because there's a few different researchers that are interested in doing different experiments with these bones. And we'll collect a few and then we'll ship them back as soon as we get back to land. Yeah. 
Apart from worms, the scientists also collect a cross-section of mud from near the whale carcass, what they call a push core. They jam the push core down in the mud, and it's actually really soft, fluffy mud. When we bring it up, I can show you guys. I take the mud out, and I do little three-centimeter cross-sections of the mud and process it for different depths. So you can actually see the blackness where it gets anoxic, all the oxygen is gone. So that's a good juicy one. After several hours on the seabed, the ROV is finally brought back to the mothership and its samples retrieved. Oh, the dive went really well. Very happy. Um, the visibility was much better than it was a couple weeks ago when everybody went out. And we found lots of nice worms, got great samples for the worms. The push cores went well. The mud is nice. It holds nice and still for you.